The principles for responsible banking will guide each of you, each of your banks, in aligning your business with and massively scaling up your contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals and the goals set out in the Paris Agreement, the global goals that humanity has set for its future. Now, while the principles for responsible banking are a global framework, their implementation will be specific to the context of each bank. These principles enable, they require each bank to focus where it matters most, where it can have the greatest impact on the most significant challenges and objectives of the society it serves. So I have with me here bank leaders from all five world regions and together we want to explore how the principles for responsible banking will guide banks in different regions in different parts of the world in contributing to achieving the key objectives and tackling the key challenges of their regions so i have with me representing north america guy cormier from desjardins ceo of desjardins in canada uh, from Latin America, I would like to welcome Carlos Hank Gonzalez. He is the chairman of Banorte in Mexico. For Europe, we have Christos Megalu, who's joining us from Greece as the CEO of Pireus Bank. I have to my right here, uh, Konehadi Gugushe, who's the acting CEO of the Land and Agricultural Development Bank of South Africa, and will represent her region. And Asia Pacific is represented by Norihiko Kato, who's the CEO of Gollumt Bank and who has come all the way from Mongolia to be with us here today. Welcome. So let me start in Latin America, Carlos. Um, I think not just for the environmental community, but for people worldwide, it's quite shocking to see the pictures of a burning Amazon. How are banks responding to the destruction of the Amazon, but also other ecosystems in the region? And what more can banks do to respond to this challenge, especially in the light of today's commitment? Sure, thank you very much. First of all, it's an honor for me to be here and being able to talk to you and address this very important issue that is going on uh, in the world and that we feel very proud not ignoring it as a, as a bank, I think that is the first thing we have to do, to recognize uh, the need in, in banking, the value of natural capital as a crucial in, uh, asset for the well-being of the people. We first have to recognize the risks that we have if, if we don't uh, recognize those issues. In Latin America, in the Caribbean region, I think it is uh, an extremely rich uh, in, in biological diversity region. We have 60% of our land and marine life of uh, the planet in our, in our territory. Mexico, where we have uh, our operations in Banorte, uh, is the fourth most diverse country in the world. And it is very sad to say that 50% of our flora and fauna is qualified as endangered. We have a very important uh, challenge of balancing economic development with the rec uh, rec recognizing the conservation of the region's natural capital. We definitely don't want to witness, again, those devastating fires in the regions or anywhere else in, in the world. Banks in Latin America, we have to recognize the value of natural capital, as I was mentioning in the beginning. The principles precisely for responsible bank banking provide us with the framework to align our businesses to do the sustainable development goals. And our commitment as signatories implies a new way of doing business, establish new goals and targets to maximize the positive impact of our products and services, and to minimize the social and environmental risks in our financing activities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlos. Let's move a bit further north to North America, Guy. Fossil fuel extraction is a big topic in North America. How will the principles for responsible banking, I know not an easy question, 
uh, influence how banks in North America finance the energy sector? Well, thanks, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. A real pleasure, a real privilege to be uh, with all of you. Um, yeah, it's sure that uh, in North America, there's a production of uh, 23 million barrels per day of oil, uh, and represent uh, around 23% of the world worldwide production. So there is more than 1.6 million people who works in, uh, in the oil and gas industry. So it's sure that we will have to accompany them properly in the next few years to continue to disinvest uh, carefully and proactively in fossil fuels and accelerate investment in uh, more efficient uh, energy sources. That's the way uh, North American Bank will have a, a, a huge impact on this industry. Uh, and I think the principle, I'm totally convinced of the fact that the principle will help us by um, three to four uh, specific actions that we'll, uh, we will integrate in our activities. First, accelerate the reduction of the carbon footprint of the financial institution actually in our own investment portfolios. That's something that we will probably continue to do so. Um, develop also new capacities in helping the companies, SMEs and companies that we're doing business with to help them to manage their own transition and to understand the risks and the opportunities that, uh, that are offers with climate change and how we can help them not only by loans, but also by any kind of financial products to make them uh, not only happy, but at least that they want to be more proactive in these kind of investments. And the third one is the fact that we will be able, with this new economy in front of us, to uh, invest in low carbon economy uh, in, an, in a range of new promising sectors. Yes, renewables, but energy efficiencies, uh, clean technology, smart mobility. There's new areas that our banks, our financial institution can invest in. At the end of the day, I'm totally convinced that we can have a huge impact as leaders, strong leaders in our economy because most of us are systemic in our countries. So we can change the, uh, the way some of our clients are managing their own companies. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Guy. So it's very much about working with the clients, working yeah. with those people in the country that are affected by the transition. Uh, with that in mind, let us move to Asia Pacific, to you, Norihiko. Um, I think uh, it is the world region uh, where two thirds of humanity live, it has two thirds of the world's population, so much of our future will be decided there. It also has some of the world's most crucial ecosystems, unfortunately with biodiversity in decline. Norihiko, what do you see as the key environmental challenges for your region? How are banks currently related with their financing to those challenges? And how do they need to change working with their clients to jointly address these? Thank you, Simon. Uh, it's an honor to be here to representing Asia Pacific. It's such a big region, the largest population and uh, are producing the greenhouse gas the most and the biological diversity also we have and uh, the big country, developed country too, uh, are very rapidly developing country, and also the very less developed and also island states. Uh, such a diverse uh, region is Asia. And poverty, poverty reduction, inclusion, and social issues are also facing a Asian region. And uh, the many countries are now currently rapidly growing the biggest challenge for environmental issue is that how we really are integrate the sustainability into the, the development and people are a bit busy for the development, fast economic growth. And uh, they are not necessarily are, are routinely uh, can feel or aware of the importance of this sustainability. So the education and uh, awareness and the very variety of countries are included in, in this region. We communicate each other among the countries. And uh, these are 
this big challenge of rapid growth and sustainability integration is really we need to share the, our knowledge and uh, uh, use the latest technology to make it available for the less developed countries. Uh, so on, on such a region, I need uh, really the um, developed countries and less developed countries work together. And uh, that's, I think, the key. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Norihiko. So really too much focus on fast economic growth, but mm. not so much on sustainability. Let's take that to Africa, Kunahadi. Um, Africa is also a region with uh, significant development challenges. It has the fastest growing population in the world. Mm. So from your perspective, what are the key social, economic, environmental challenges for the continent? And what role do you see for the African banking industry in tackling them? Um, thank you, Simone, and um, good afternoon, everybody. I must express um, that it is an honor and a pleasure to be here today. I think Africa um, experiences a number of social environmental challenges that um, really at the heart of it um, affect the ability of people to generate uh, their own livelihoods. So firstly, I'll talk about unemployment, underemployment, um, which becomes um, while Africa does have the fastest growing population, what we are not able to do is to generate um, enough employment um, to absorb um, the task and um, the workforce that we have. Youth unemployment in particular um, estimated to be at about 30%. Now 30% means that a third of your people are not working. A third of your people that are able and willing to work are not working. Um, and because even the employment that is there becomes either informal or casual. It also then becomes um, insecure. When you've got insecure employment, then it makes it difficult to plan. It makes it difficult to invest in the things that you need to. So as financial institutions, um, it's important for us to look at ourselves and say, how do we respond appropriately to the challenges that are facing um, ourselves uniquely? How do we respond appropriately to really becoming a catalyst for small business development, for creating opportunities of employment um, for those people that we need to? We talk about climate and climate change, and this is something that really um, resonates very closely with me, um, with the Land Bank being an agricultural development bank um, about five years ago in 2015, we saw the worst drought recorded in history. And what we are seeing at the moment is that what we took for granted as agricultural seasons is things that have shifted. Um, while now we see that rains are coming six to eight weeks late, it means that we are not able to plan appropriately. It means that we are not able to schedule um, either the financing that we are supposed to do, but also it affects the yields that are fetched by those farmers that we, that we support and so on. So climate change is not something that is up in the air that is not being experienced. It is practically being felt um, not only by our clients, but also by us as financiers. So it then becomes important for us to really try and support the people that we work with to say, how do they adjust their practices such that we can respond and contribute to a more sustainable future? How do we adjust the things that we finance? Because by making financing available, you can then entrench a much better behavior. You can entrench a much better investment being made by people. Africa has less developed infrastructure and the kind of infrastructure that we as financiers invest in or provide financing availability for will also determine the future and how we are then able to make sure that as we are trying to develop, the, to develop our countries, we are doing so in a responsible manner. We are doing so in a manner that ensures the sustainability of our future and future generations.
Okay. Thank you very much, Konehari. So unemployment, youth unemployment, informal employment, changes in season seasonality affecting farmers, but also making sure that uh, infrastructure is planned in a sustainable way. Can you give a few examples how you feel banks in Africa can make substantial contributions to these three challenges that you named? As I indicated, banks, um, the role that banks play um, is really um, becoming a catalyst um, to development, making available um, funding, making available funding in a, a most appropriate manner. So where you have um, funding that is incentivized, for example, um, for renewable energy, where you have funding that is incentivized um, to get our clients to adopt more sustainable methods um, of farming practice, um, there is a drive for mechanization because it improves efficiency and productivity. However, um, we need to make sure that we don't do this at, ex at the expense of employment, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to encourage um, either manufacturing, um, small businesses to, to, to really thrive. And by the financing that we make available, we can, I feel that we can really do this. Okay, thank you very much. So, incentivizing, nudging clients, but with a balance. Let's go to Europe here, Christos. Incentivizing, nudging clients. Is that something that European banks are, are looking into? And if so, what are the areas that you're planning to focus on? What are the areas where you feel banks in Europe can really make a significant difference? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Simone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor uh, to be here uh, with uh, all of us today to commit to the principles for responsible banking. Well, in Europe, uh, uh, we are in the, front, for, in the forefront of the transition to a low-carbon low economy. And of course, uh, the banking industry uh, voluntarily, also with this initiative, is supporting this uh, transition. Uh, there is a need for collective initiatives, and this is what uh, we are doing uh, now, to amplify the efforts that uh, individual banks are doing, and all of, all of the banks being here in the panel and here with all of us are doing uh, the same. Uh, we are um, focusing on the principles to have guidance uh, for the banks, to create value for our customers, our shareholders and the society. It's a global framework. It's a framework that uh, uh, will allow us to integrate sustainability across all business areas of the bank, starting from the strategic to the portfolio and then to the transaction level. And this is what we are inspiring and this is how we will be able to disseminate all this effort through uh, uh, from our systems down to our employees and down to our customers. One word on Europe. Europe has pledged to become climate neutral by 2050. To meet this objective and uh, the Paris Agreement objective, we need an additional 180 billion euro to finance uh, policies and investments for a low carbon economy. We have the EU Action Plan for Sustainable Growth and we have introduced legislation and guidelines in order to reorient our capital flows towards these sustainable investments. So we are enabling the players in the, in the industries in order to enhance sustainability. And that we think as banks is a very, very important role. Okay. Thank you very much, Christos. I think you have uh, emphasized something very important, and that is elevating sustainability to the strategic level, which is one of the key features of these principles. Carlos, thinking about Banorta's strategy, um, and at the same time thinking about uh, one challenge that Latin America really faces, which is inequality. How can you adjust your strategy 
to address inequality and, and make a contribution to a more equitable future in Mexico and, and wider Latin America? Sure, thank you very much. First of all, I think it's very important to say, as you were mentioning, uh, inequality has been undermining the growth of Latin America for a long time. Inequality has been a threat to the growth of countries all over Latin America and, and Mexico. And if we just analyze the numbers, uh, what the Global uh, Index uh, has given us, is that more than 40% of the people that live in Latin America don't have access to financial services. That means it's close to 200 million people that do not have access to financial services. In Mexico alone, more than 50% of our population does not have access to a financial uh, institution. So I think uh, for us as banks, and specifically in Banorte, we take this very seriously. Our role is a very important role that can and should allow to transform uh, the growth uh, for the GDPs of our countries by bringing financial services closer to the marginalized populations. And one very specific thing that we take very seriously uh, at Banorte and all our banks in Latin America are doing so and we must do so is, first of all, to recognize that we have not only a responsibility to our shareholders or to our collaborators, the people that work with us, but we have a very, very important compromise with society. And that compromise with society must take us uh, closer and, and, and change our strategy, as you were mentioning, Simone, and in, in order to, for us to focus into being able to bring these financial services closer to these marginalized uh, communities. We have a very important tool now that we can use, which is technology. Technology is now a big ally for us and has to be a big ally in order for us to bring financial services to these types of marginalized communities. I think the more we can contribute as banks, as financial institutions into bringing uh, financial services to marginalized uh, regions, we will be working together and helping and giving our grain of uh, uh, of salt in order for uh, our, our countries to reach the levels of growth and reduce the problem of inequality that we have. Okay. I think the principles of banking that we're signing right now should give us a very good line uh, of work in that sense. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. So bringing financial services closer to underserved populations is one of the solutions for addressing inequality. Uh, Norihiko, let's take that uh, to, to Asia. Um, I think also there, um, a lot of the population does not have access to financial services. How do you see banks in Asia um, addressing inequality, maybe not just in terms of income, but also in terms of gender? Mm, gender. Mm. Well, our, the, uh, the inclusive uh, financing is uh, pretty much developing quickly in Asia now. And uh, there's still uh, the woman the gender equality is not really included or accomplished yet. So the business leaders are men dominated and uh, the, less, uh, the, the women business are facing difficulty to, to borrowing from the financial institutions. Of course, the microfinance and those are, are and uh, are international agencies supports are making a success, I think. Uh, for for women's uh, support, uh, but there are still a lot a lot to, to do. Okay, okay. Taking uh, the women to uh, to North America, Guy, um, but also maybe looking at other social issues that are relevant in your region. How do you see Desjardins playing a stronger role in addressing a number of key social challenges? Well, probably Desjardins, but also all the other North American banks, too. Uh, there's many challenges in North America, uh, maybe two that I want to con concentrate on. Um, the first one is uh, income inequality and poverty. Uh, poverty is relative. Uh, we maybe think that, or we're all convinced that North America is, uh, is perceived as one of the most prosperous uh, place in the world. But at the same time, there is still poverty and there's still inequality. And uh, financial institutions will have a, a key role to play 
to fight these uh, these challenges. And there's one specific area that at Desjardins, but also I think a lot of financial institutions are working on, is education. How can we be more proactive, present in the educational system? Uh, how do we encourage kids to stay in school? Uh, it could be award scholarships, could be programs, uh, investing in some programs with uh, universities, a uh, college. Um, it could be also just uh, supporting educational platform. So how can we be more proactive as financial institution to contribute to a better educational system? It's one way to fight against uh, inequality and poverty. And in our own financial institution, there's a second challenge that we, that we should do better, is diversity in the place of women. Uh, actually, uh, more than a half of the workforce in our financial institution are women, but uh, less, less than 20% are in the senior management team, are in the, are in the c suit So um, we have to find new solutions to uh, encourage groups that help women to uh, network together, to have access to mentor, um, share examples of uh, female uh, role models that can bring to our women that are working for our financial institution to have the uh, to harness the potential that they can achieve and uh, men need also our men who works at the, in our financial institution need also to uh, promote and create conditions that will contribute to see more women to have access to senior management uh, executive uh, department. So uh, set targets and be more proactive to achieve it. Absolutely. Speaking of target setting, uh, Christos, uh, the key mechanism of the principles for responsible banking is to set targets where the bank can really have the most significant impact. And invariably that will be in the bank's core business. So when you think about European banks, in which core business areas and, and on which topics would you expect them to set targets? One, one, uh, one word uh, before that. Uh, yeah. Just to say, uh, you know, the principles, uh, you know, the, it, it's for banks and especially banks in Europe that, you know, over the uh, uh, crisis uh, years have been in a way, uh, uh, you know, kind of in a difficult position, is a first-class opportunity to re-establish the role of the banks in society and, uh, uh, and, and showing that the banks are uh, uh, responsible and, and uh, they are uh, really placing society at the heart of, of our activity. So that is, that is a very important uh, uh, element that we should uh, take into account. In terms of, uh, of uh, action plans, you know, there have been legislative and non-legislative proposals and measures, taxonomy, benchmarks, non-financial uh, disclosures, and uh, uh, investors will be able then to make decisions on uh, sustainability and uh, making sure which bank does what. But the sectors that uh, we think that uh, in the forefront of our effort they should be renewable energy, energy savings and climate change mitigation projects, electric cars, green buildings, waste, water, environmental technology, forestry, agri-food. And uh, these are areas where uh, Europe uh, plays a, a, a very big role in the transition to a low carbon economy. We need to place all of this into the heart of the strategy and the implementation of, of each bank and uh, create the structure that will disseminate that to uh, all employees. And at the end of the day, uh, this is going to be making the difference in, uh, in Europe, but also globally. Okay. Thank you very much, Christos. I think to summarize a bit, so for Europe, we hear that the low carbon economic transition is a key issue that uh, European banks can contribute to. Uh, for Latin America, I think we hear that natural capital is crucial for the well-being of people, uh, and it is a matter of, of recognizing and understanding the interconnections. 
and that inequality undermines growth currently and banks can play a key role in addressing that by uh, providing access to more financial services for people who don't have that at the moment. I think for Africa, we hear very clearly the challenge of unemployment, especially among youth of decent uh, employment. Um, and I think for Asia, we hear there has been a focus on fast economic growth, um, but maybe less of sustainable growth. And there is a huge need for transferring technology, and that's something that banks can support. And I think, Guy, for, for North America, uh, I think it's become clear that it's really about helping companies to transition and helping people cope with the transition. So I think that gives us a, a quite uh, interesting view of, of the challenges uh, and the potential roles we have for banks across different regions. Um, while this panel is about the regional aspects, um, I do think it is interesting to take a moment to think about, well, Implementation is going to be region specific, but why is it nevertheless important to have a global framework, a global language, a global vision for the banking industry? And uh, maybe Norihiko, we want to start with you here. Yes, the principle the framework is so important. And in Asia, developing countries typically are the people's awareness, even in the banking industry or uh, any stakeholders, in order to speak up the importance and appeal the importance of sustainability, having the principle or not is a very big difference. And uh, this framework is universal. The planet Earth doesn't have a country border. And, uh, one country's efforts doesn't solve the problem. So the Asian countries, as fast, fast growth are we, what we are making, we should really need to increase our awareness and uh, everybody think, taking into the sustainability, when, whenever do the, the, the big economic activities, are, that is really the uh, critical and first point and uh, the principle is really help uh, to, to increase awareness of the, any stakeholders in the region. That will help our business too. Okay, thank you very much. Kunehadi, why is a global framework crucial? Uh, thank you. So while I, while I agree that implementation um, is important for it to be regional because each region um, has to respond to the particular challenges that it is faced with and it has to design um, its own solutions. Um, a global framework allows you um, to learn from each other, which I think is a very important part of making sure that um, there's at least some level of certainty um, in terms of what is expected to be done. Um, there is, you know, the saying that says what gets measured gets done. Um, that accountability of setting targets, um, specifying certain actions that you are going to take, and then measuring that as you go along the way, and the transparency of being able to report that such that you can then have a certain community that holds you accountable um, to what you have committed to. I think it's a very important um, um, part of it that um, as the banks that are here not only do we just give our commitment, but we also then have an accountability leg to it. Um, and I think, I think lastly, you know, it is important because ultimately it brings standardization and it brings um, um, a certain oneness within, within the different re regions that you, are, that, that you are in. So a global, a global framework um, allows you to then speak a common language um, so that we can all be able to strive towards the same thing. Because when we don't, we could be just pulling um, across, across one another. Okay. So really a, a common language and a learning from each other. That does bring me to my last question. Today, it is 130 banks signing a commitment, but at the same time, this is a start of an alliance between the United Nations and the global banking industry. So in the spirit of 
common language and learning from each other. What do you expect from the UN and what can the UN expect from you? Guy. Well, uh, I think uh, the UN is uh, already helping us to uh, work together and bring around the table maybe not all the players around the globe, but at least many, many players around the globe, um, will help us to promote an ongoing dialogue, shared best practices with all the colleagues in this room, um, and maintain IBAR, where we will have year after year to follow the trend and try to be better and better and better. So I think UN, for this reason, is really helpful for us. At the same time, the financial institution will have uh, to be more transparent. We'll have to be, uh, to collaborate together, to cooperate together, to share best practices, but maybe to be in touch all together. Maybe not to look at us as competitors, but sometimes to look at us as really cooperators to see if we can uh, work as one team and to set for us ambitious goals, ambitious plans that will help us to, to at least uh, follow, follow the road, follow the path and uh, attain our achieve what we want to achieve. All right. I like this image, working as one team. Carlos, working as one team with your peers, with the UN, what do you expect from both going forward? I think it's very important to recognize that what the UN does is address the most important issues and challenges that the world have. So I feel very proud and honored to be with all my peers and colleagues here and listening to Guy and uh, also what Ralph was saying, that we are, what we're doing here right now is recognizing that we have a challenge, a problem in the world, that we as in financial institutions can work together. I like uh, what uh, Guy was also mentioning, that we can work together and not always be uh, looking at us as competitors because we are recognizing that we, we can do a difference and make a difference in the world. I think also what the Secretary General was mentioning uh, at the beginning, it's the only way we can address and be efficient in getting results in challenges like this is by private and public associations. So I think what we're living right now, and I feel very honored to be able to be a part of this, and the association between the UN and the financial institutions of the world in order for us to work towards a specific challenge that we are all recognizing. I think it's something that will uh, be, uh, our children will be thankful. And I think uh, we take not only the the homework and that we need to apply this in our regions, but also, as Ralph was mentioning in the beginning, that we need to, to convince the rest of uh, the industry that is not represented here right now to be a part of this alliance. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I think wonderful points uh, uh, towards the end. So really, the principles for responsible banking are addressing key challenges in your region in the way that is needed for your region, but they're also very much about learning from each other and about understanding that together we can really make a difference in the world. Thank you very much, everyone.